Hello everyone, I am Sharath. In this video, I will be discussing the essay Annihilation of Cars written by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Even though Ambedkar is a person who needs no introduction, let me begin with a short introduction about Ambedkar. Ambedkar is often mentioned as the symbol of knowledge, a scholar, social reformer, and a leader who dedicated himself to annihilate social inequality and caste system in India. As all of you know, he was the first Minister of Law and Justice of Independent India, Chief Architect of Constitution of India. He authored several books which analyze Indian caste system. The essay selected here is actually a, an undelivered speech written in 1936. Ambika here speaks of how people are identified and referred in the caste-based society. It is actually Ambedkar's most radical text. The arguments made in this speech are not directed at a Hindu fundamentalist alone, but at those who consider themselves as moderate. Ambedkar called them the best of Hindus, and they are referred by later academics as the left-wing Hindus. Ambedkar's point is that to believe in Hindu shastras and to simultaneously think of oneself as liberal or moderate is a contradiction. When the text of Annihilation of Caste was published, Mahatma Gandhi himself responded to the Ambedkar's provocation. Gandhi said, I quote, Annihilation of caste has to be read only because it is open to serious objection. Dr. Ambedkar is a challenge to Hinduism. No Hindu who praises his faith about life itself can afford to underrate the importance of this indictment. That is what Gandhi said about Annihilation of caste. The battle unfolded between Mahatma Gandhi and Ambedkar in the heart of India's national movement unveils the different political trajectory that Ambedkar took. Well, now I think a brief account of the context of the speech will help to put things in perspective. On 12 December 1935, B.R. Ambedkar had been asked by the Jetpat Todak Mandal, that means a society for the abolition of caste system, a Hindu reformist group to address the annual conference and deliver a speech about the caste system in India. When he sent his speech titled Annihilation of Caste to the committee, they found some of the statements are against Hinduism and its, its Shastras. Later, Ambedkar was asked to remove certain sessions, which they found in their own words unbearable. Ambedkar responded that he would not change even a comma. Then they cancelled the program. When they cancelled the program, Ambedkar published the essay under the title Annihilation of Caste. So actually the book is a text in search of the audience it was written for. And we can say that the speech survived an assassination attempt to become what it is today. The title of the essay itself reveals the content as well as the aim of essay. Ambedkar begins his speech by saying that he is an unsuitable president for the conference. He expresses his regret to Jetpet Torak Mandal because he believes that they will be asked many questions for the selection of Ambedkar as the president of their annual meeting because Ambedkar is a person from lower caste. At the very outset itself, Ambedkar unleashes his criticism with a tone of mockery. He says that the Mandal may be asked to explain by the orthodox Hindus why it has disobeyed the Shastric injunctions of Hindus in selecting the president. According to Hindu Shastras, Brahman is the guru of the three Varnas, that is the three dominant Varnas, Kshatriya, Vaishya and uh, Brahman. So Ambika presumes that the Mandal may be aware of the Shastric injunctions that uh, from whom a Hindu should take his lessons and from whom he should not. Ambika further mentions Deshbodh, a socio-political religious treatise by Ramdas. Ramdas is a Brahman saint from Maharashtra who is believed to have inspired Shivaji. According to Ramdas, in, in, in his text, Ramdas made it clear uh, while addressing the Hindus that they can't accept an Andija. Andija means uh, a, an untouchable or a lower caste person as Guru even if that person is a Pandit. Ambika made it clear that he accepted the request of the Mandal against his wish because the aim of the committee is social reform. That has always made an appeal to him. Then Ambedkar explains the logic behind his argument that social reform is needed for political reform. According to Ambedkar, social reform in India has few friends and many critics. He identifies two categories of critics. The first is political reformers and second is socialists. Then he speaks of the first category of critics of social reform, that is political reformers. By taking International Congress as the platform of India's political reformation, he analyzes different approaches and beliefs of INC. He says that without social efficiency, permanent progress is not possible and Hindu society is not in a state of uh, efficiency as it is fragmented and dispersed because of caste system. 
Ambedkar believed that that may be the reason why the birth of International Congress was accompanied by the formation of Social Conference. In the beginning, the aim of Social Conference was, the, was to reform Hindu society and the political organization focused in political reform. Gradually, it developed into two and their different parties, Political Reform Party and Social Reform Party. Political Reform Party was supported by ANC and Social Reform Party was supported by Social Conference. And they turned out to be two hostile camps. The point that they debated was what should happen first, political reform or social reform. Political reform party gained the supremacy and gradually social conference declined and later vanished away. Further, Ambedkar clarifies that he wants social reform to precede political reform. In order to justify his arguments, he brings supporting evidence. He demonstrates the plight of untouchables and the social milieu of India under caste system. He enumerates several discriminations and rules laid down by upper caste people to suppress lower caste people. In India, untouchables were not even allowed to use public street in many places. And in Maratha country, the untouchable should wear a black thread either on his wrist or around his neck as a sign or a mark to prevent the Hindus from getting themselves polluted by his touch or by mistake. In Pune, the untouchable was required to carry or strung from his waist a broom to sweep away from him behind himself if the dust he trod on. Otherwise, the Hindu walking on the same dust will be polluted. These were the uh, these were some of the beliefs that that Indians practiced through their caste system. In Indo state, another example that Ambedkar mentioned here is uh, from Indo state. In uh, the, the, there, the upper caste people uh, put forward a few guidelines uh, for ballets. If the ballets want to live among the upper caste people, they must observe these guidelines. Ballets must not wear gold lace bordered purges. They must not wear dhotis with colored or fancy borders. They must convey intimation of death of any Hindu to relatives of the deceased, no matter how far away this person live. Balis must play music before and during the procession of all Hindu marriages. The other interesting fact is that Balis must render service without demanding remuneration and must accept whatever a Hindu is pleased to give. So these are the uh, important uh, guidelines given by the upper caste people for the ballets to live among them. If they are not ready to obey these rules, they have to clear out the village. Further, Ambeka gives more instances of untouchability. The ballets were not allowed to get water from the common village wells. Another incident happened in Gujarat is that the high caste Hindus ordered the untouchables not to insist upon sending their children to common village government school. Another point Ambedkar highlights is the untouchables were beaten since they served ghee in a dinner function. According to caste system, an untouchable must not use ghee even if he can afford to buy it. Ghee was a mark of high social status. Ambedkar enumerates lots of discriminations, uncivilized practices of high caste people and Indian caste system in order to justify his point that social reformation should precede political reformation. It, it, in order to have a uh, strong, unified society, India should go for social reformation before political reformation. Ambedkar here drew a dexterous dichotomy between social reform in the sense of the reformation of the Hindu family and social reform in the sense of the reorganization and reconstruction of the Hindu society. For Ambedkar, reformation of the Hindu family cannot be considered as social reformation. It restricts itself to widow remarriage and abolition of child marriage, etc. For him, social reformation means the reformation of the entire Hindu society, that is the eradication of the untouchability and caste system as well. In the beginning, social conference gave importance for a radical change in the Hindu society, but later they gave focus only to reform the high caste Hindu family, because the social conference turned out to be a body of high caste people only. Ambedkar then emphasizes the political slogan that congressmen adopted from J.S. Mill, that is, one country is not fit to rule another country. Congress upholds this dogma for political reformation and for the concept of Swaraj. Mbarkar's point is that, since the Congress repeats the slogan, they must admit that one class or caste is not fit to rule another caste or class. Another important argument of Ambedkar is that political revolutions of different parts of the world have always been preceded by social and religious revolutions. He cites a few examples. The first is that of Reformation. The Reformation in Germany, started by Luther, was the precursor of the political emancipation of European people. Puritanism led to the establishment of political liberty. Another example he considered is that of Arabs. 
Before the Arabs became a political power, they had undergone a thorough religious revolution started by Prophet Muhammad. Chandragupta's case is not different. Chandragupta's political revolution was preceded by religious and social revolutions of Buddha. It is also true in the case of Sikhs. Guru Nanak brought social revolution. That means the emancipation of the mind and soul is the first and foremost thing for the political expansion of the people. So he argues that political reformation or the movement for Swaraj in India should precede social reformation. Ambekar says that even economic reform should precede social reform. I already mentioned the two categories of critics that Ambekar identified against the social reform in the beginning of his speech. They were political reformers and socialists. Ambika criticized the political reformers and explained the need for social reformation to precede political reformation in Indian context. Now Ambika analyzes the ideological stance of socialists. The socialists believe that man is an economic creature and all his activities and aspirations are bound by economic facts alone. They consider property is the only source of power, hence they believe an equality in property or wealth will bring reform. They gave importance to economic reformation over political and social reformation. Ambika breaks the socialist view by saying that economic factors are not the only source of power. Social status can be a source of power. In India, caste gives social status. Religion can be a source of power. Hence, religion, social status and wealth are all sources of power and authority in India. Those who wield this kind of power will control the authority of others will control the liberty of others. So Ambekar says that social reformation should precede even economic reformation in Indian context because man is not an economic entity. Ambekar further says that if the source of power and domain is social and religious, then social reformation is essential. In India, it is religion and caste system wield power and hence they enslave people. Ambika then says that the economic reform of the socialists cannot come true unless there is revolution resulting in the seizure of power. And that seizure of power must be by a proletariat. Ambika then asks, will the proletariat of India ever join or campaign to bring about this revolution? Because they are classified, suppressed not only by economic factors alone, but also by social factors like a caste system. According to Ambekar, the only thing that will move one man to take part of a revolution is when he gets a feeling that equality and fraternity will be available to him. He should get these two at least even after revolution. Ambekar asks the socialists, is it possible to give equality and fraternity even after revolution in a caste-based society? Will they unite only for economic equality alone? And Ambekar's answer is no. Ambika says that destruction of economic hierarchies will not bring social equality in India. Socialists are blind with the economic factors alone. That is why Ambika considers socialists as a critic of social reform. According to Ambika, caste is the only monster that one finds in all directions in India. All kinds of reform, whether it is political or economical, should precede the murder of the monster. That means eradication of the caste system or the annihilation of the caste system is the only possible way to achieve social reformation in India or any other kind of reformation in India. Ambekar then breaks the more popular argument of the defenders of the caste system. That is, caste is often defended on the ground that it is a division of labor. Since division of labor is adequate in every civilized society, it is argued that there is nothing wrong in caste system. But Ambika rejects this argument by saying that caste is not a division of labor, but it is a division of laborers. Further, caste system grades the divided laborers one above the other. That means the labor is not divided based on aptitude, skill, capacity or competence of a person, but based on the social status of the parents. The birth of a person is given more importance than his skill. The caste system divided occupation forever through Chaudhurvanya. And no individual is allowed to select or change occupation based on his taste or skill. He views that caste system becomes a direct cause for the unemployment because it will not permit readjustment of occupation. Ambika further adds that caste is a harmful institution. It involves the subordination of man's natural powers and inclinations. Ambika then uh, further talks about the imaginary racial purity that the propagators of caste system promote. Ambika says that caste is not eugenic. Caste system is a social division of people of the same race. 
According to Ambedkar, the caste system came long after the different races of India had blended blood and culture. So nobody can claim that caste is for the preservation of the purity of race and purity of blood. Ambedkar criticizes the, uh, ca the, the prohibition of interdining. Caste system prohibits interdining, which cannot infect blood or purity. So caste has no scientific origin according to Ambedkar. Then Ambika says that caste is a social system which embodies the arrogance and selfishness of a perverse section of Hindus who were superior enough in social status to set it in fashion and who had authority to force it on their inferiors. Ambika then views that caste prevents Hindus from forming a society. Caste has completely disorganized and demoralized the Hindus. According to Ambika, Hindu society is a myth. That means the social feeling and oneness is an imagination, not real inside Hindu society. There is no concrete relation between caste inside the Hindu society. Hindu society is a collection of caste. Each ha caste has uh, its own consciousness, its own feeling, and they try to celebrate their difference than similarities. In every Hindu, the consciousness that exists is the consciousness of his caste. So Ambika says that Indians are an amorphous mass of people. Men cannot form society by living in physical proximity alone. Similarity in habits and customs, beliefs and thoughts is not enough to constitute men into a society. Physical proximity doesn't mean that the people have social feeling. Similarly, distances won't break the strength of society. In India, the people are divided inside their mind because of caste system. Ambedkar considers the worst feature of caste system as the antisocial spirit. Caste system made an attempt to give a noble origin to one caste and ignoble origin to others. An antisocial spirit is found whenever one group has its own interest. In caste system, each group has their own interest. So we can say that uh, there is antisocial spirit inside the Hinduism and inside the caste system. The Brahmin's primary concern is to protect his interest against those of the non-Brahmins. And the non-Brahmins' primary concern is to protect their interest against those of the Brahmins. In short, we can say that Hindus are, in a, are a collective of many warring groups. The existence of caste and caste consciousness has served to keep the memory of past feuds alive between caste and has prevented from uh, forming a solidarity inside Hinduism. He then views that caste has prevented the Hindus from helping the aboriginals. 13 millions of Indians are still in savage state, living in the midst of civilization and are leading the life of hereditary criminals. Caste system never teaches anyone to reform fellow people. A Hindu's whole life is an anxious effort to preserve his caste. A Hindu will never do what Christian missionaries are doing for the downtrodden and aboriginals. That is the difference between Hinduism and the other religion according to Ambedkar. Caste, the caste is the real explanation why the Hindu has let the savage remain a savage. The high caste always conspire to keep the lower caste in a lower position. Ambedkar gives two instances where the high caste people deliberately stop the lower caste people from imitating them. Two examples given are from Maharashtra. The Sonars, a lower caste community, stylized themselves like Brahmins and started wearing dhoti in the same manner as the Brahmins wear and they, they used the word Namaskar for salutation. When the Brahmins noticed this, by using the dhoti of Peshwas, they put, it, put this attempt down. Another incident is that of Patar Prabhu community. With an aim of raising the status of their community, a group of Patar Prabhus sought to stop widowry marriage that was prevalent in their community. Widowry marriage is not prevalent among Brahmins of the time, so some of them considered it as a mark of social inferiority for their community. Patar Prabhu community divided in opinion, and some supported the widowry marriage, some opposed. The Peshwas took the side of those who supported the uh, widow remarriage even though the Brahmins don't have a widow remarriage in their community. This reveals that the Brahmins want a clear distinction between them and the other caste. They like to have a signature of their own. Their practices don't want to be imitated by other community. Comparing Hinduism with Islam in the backdrop of caste system, Mbeka says he has no hesitation in saying that if the Mohammedan has been cruel, the Hindu has been mean. According to Ambedkar, meanness is worse than cruelty. He speaks of how caste system prevents Hindus from being a missionary religion. As the caste system expanded, what happened was Hindu religion stopped to be a missionary religion according to Ambedkar. Earlier Ambedkar had mentioned the approach of Hindus to, uh, to aboriginals and uh, other marginal class people. And he made the comment that Hindu will never do what Christian missionaries are doing. 
here in this section, Ambekar confirms that Hindu religion can't be a missionary religion because caste system prevents Hindus from accepting others. The lack of social spirit is another reason. Further, Hinduism failed to see the need of others. So, Hindu religion can't be a missionary religion according to Ambedkar. Caste is inconsistent with the conversion. Further, whatever prevents Hindu, Hindu society from accepting conversion is not only the teaching of beliefs and dogmas, but also a place for the convert in the social life of the community. Which caste they will belong, that is the major problem for the Hindus. Hindu society is a collection of castes, and each caste being a closed corporation, there is no place for the convert. Castes are autonomous and there is no authority anywhere to compel a caste to admit a newcomer to its social life. According to Ambedkar, as long as caste remains, Hindu's religion cannot be transformed as a missionary religion. Thus, it is the caste system which has prevented Hindus from expanding and accepting other religious communities. Ambedkar here compares Hindus with the six Muslims and Christians. Ambika views that it is due to the strength arising out of the feeling that all Sikhs will come to the rescue of a Sikh when he is in danger and that all Mohammedans will rush to save a Muslim if he is attacked. This feeling helped both Sikhs and Muslims could form Sankatan or organization. They developed a mutual help, trust and fellow feeling. There is no such feeling in Hinduism. The Hindu can derive no such strength. So an organization is impossible for Hindus. Being one and alone, he remains powerless and developed a timidity and a cowardice alone. There is associated mode of living in Sikh, uh, in Sikh religion and the, in Mohammedans, in Muslim religion. But there is no such a cementing force in Hinduism. Hindus are tolerant not because they are uh, broad-hearted but because they are too weak and timid. Caste system has made a co formation of cooperation uh, I mean, impossible even for a good cause. An individual's independent opinion, belief or dissent against the norms and standards or, or the authority of the group is the beginning of all reform, according to Ambedkar. But caste system has an unquestioned right to excommunicate any man who is guilty of breaking the rules of the caste. According to Ambedkar, caste is ever ready to take advantage of the helplessness of a man. Caste system demands complete conformity. Caste in the hands of orthodox has been a powerful weapon for persecuting reformers, reformation and for killing all reform. Excommunication is the powerful weapon used by a caste system. Ambika then finds that caste has destroyed public spirit, public opinion and public charity. Even the public domain is restricted to certain castes. Virtue has become caste ridden and morality has become caste bound. Hindus public is just is caste. Charity begins with the caste and ends with the caste. There is sympathy but not for the people of other caste. So virtue has become caste and everything is bounded to, limited to the caste system. There is no appreciation of the merit. In short, the capacity to appreciate merit without considering, considering caste does not exist in Hinduism. Ambedkar then gives his concepts of an ideal society. According to Ambedkar, an ideal society would be a society based on liberty, equality and fraternity. Such a society should be mobile and should have paths for conveying change. In an ideal society, there should be many interests and those diverse perspectives should be consciously communicated and shared. There should be social endosmosis, that means people as well as ideas should get chances to transgress. Democracy is not merely a form of government, it is a mode of associated living. So Ambika believes that fraternity and democracy are same and one should show reverence to one's fellow men. Equality must be the governing principle of such a democracy. It should have liberty to choose one's profession. Ambika believes that in an ideal society, a person is allowed to select his profession based on his taste. And he says that to object liberty is to perpetuate slavery. For Ambika, slavery is not only the legalized form of subjection but also, but also a state of society where some men are forced to accept others. So in an ideal society, individuals ought to be treated alike. Ambika then criticizes Arya Samajam who were trying to propagate the Chaturvarnya. Arya Samajam considers the Chaturvarnya as an ideal social organization. And they divided, they tried to propagate the division of the Manu uh, as a society into four castes instead of 4,000 castes as we have in India. 
he rejects Adi Samajan's labeling or the continuation of their labeling of the Vedas uh, as men into Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra. In order to make it attractive, the propagators of Chaduvarnia claim that the division is not based on birth but based on guna or the worth of a person. Ambiti clearly rejects that argument and states that the division of, uh, division of caste is based on birth. If it is based on worth of a person, a person should be allowed to select his profession, should be free to move from one caste to another caste as his worth improves. There is no possibility for such a change in caste system. Chadurvan would be the most vicious system for the Shudras because it won't allow them to grow or improve their social status. They are not allowed to acquire wealth because if they were wealthy, they will be independent. Other high caste people are afraid of that. Shudras are prohibited to acquire knowledge and arms because if they were allowed to acquire these two, there, there is a possibility of a rebellion and the higher caste people are afraid of the rebellion. The upper caste so conspires against the lower caste to let them down and to keep them always in a lower position. They are disabled and muted. Then Ambekar speaks of the Brahman Kshatriya rivalry as evident in Puranas and Mahabharata. They even quarreled over petty questions like who should salute first, who should give way first when they to met in street. Chadavane is not adequate even for the high caste people according to Ambedkar. The rivalry and enmity between different Varnas demonstrate that the caste system is a system to preserve the interest of certain Varnas. Then Ambedkar speaks of the ways to reform Hindu social order and how can abolish caste system. He views that change of social order is necessary to achieve social reform. One cannot build anything on the foundation of caste system in India. Two dominant views to abolish caste system are abolition of subcaste and promotion of interdining. But Ambedkar rejects both these ideas. He says that abolition of subcaste may strengthen the caste system. The past experience of interdining is not positive. It failed to kill the spirit of caste and the consciousness of caste. So according to Ambedkar, the real remedy is in the caste marriage. Rejection of Hindu Shastras and destruction of its sanctity are the proper way to destroy caste system. Then Ambekar says that political tyranny is a comparatively weaker enemy when compared to social tyranny. So a social reformer needs more strength and courage than a political reformer. Ambekar further considers the social tyranny exercised through caste system is more dangerous than the political tyranny of the British. Caste is not a physical object. It is a state of mind. People observe caste system because they are deeply religious. Like Buddha and Guru Nanak, one should reject Shastras and deny the authority of Varnas to annihilate caste system and reform the Hindu society. Another view of Ambedkar is that internal reform of the caste system is virtually impossible. Caste is the natural outcome of certain religious beliefs which have the sanction of Shastras which are believed to contain the commands of the divinely inspired sages. They are believed to have supernatural wisdom. In caste system, disobey of their command is equal to committing sin. So caste has divine basis, hence internal reform seems impossible. So the destruction of the sacredness and disobey of these Shastras are the possible means to bring social reform. Brahmins are further considered as Bhutans, that means gods on earth. They have the divine sanction to bear knowledge. No one else is allowed to teach or impart knowledge in Indian caste system. So Brahmins are such a powerful intellectual class who holds the rest of the community in their grips. They object all kinds of reform because it will reduce their authority and power and social status. And a man who is born as Brahmin has much less desire to become a revolutionary. So for Ambedkar, the chances of success in a movement for the breakup of caste system appear very remote. Because in every country, the intellectual class is the most influential class who can foresee things and lead people. Here the intellectual class is Brahmins and who support the caste system. So the change is a remote possibility according to Ambedkar. The two important aspects of caste system identified by Ambedkar are it divides men into separate communities. Secondly, it places these communities in a graded order, one above the other in social status. So each caste finds consolation and uh, takes a pride that they are above some other caste in the scale of social system. The higher the grade of the caste, the greater the number of rights. The lower the grade, the number of rights reduce. So destruction of the caste system is the only possible way to reform the Hindu society. That is Ambedkar's view.
In this speech, Ambedkar unveiled the logical, irrational, unethical and immoral nature of the caste system. He says that he is not against a true religion and the destruction of the caste system would not destroy the true principle of a true religion. He says that true religion should be like principles. Principles do not prescribe a specific cause of action. But here in India, the caste system is just like rules. Rules prescribe specific cause of action, like cooking recipes. Hindu religion, as contained in the Vedas and Smritis, is nothing but a mass of sacrificial, social, political and sanitary rules and regulations. So Ambekar concludes says, by saying that it is not a religion at all. For Ambekar, a true religion should be universal, applicable to all races, to all countries and to all time. A religion should not be prescriptive like rules. For Ambekar considered Hinduism as a law or a legalist class ethics. He concludes his speech by saying that defending Hindus under Swaraj is more serious issue than defending Swaraj through political reformation. And he believes without the social reformation, a Swaraj for Hindu may turn out to be only a step towards slavery. These are major arguments that Ambedkar made in his speech. In short, we can say that Hinduism promotes conformity to commands, caste is another name to control individual freedom. It destroys social spirit, communal spirit, fellow feeling, etc. Caste does not allow a person to transgress caste limits. So, now I think it is necessary to mention Gandhi's stand on caste system in comparison with that of Ambedkar. Gandhi believed that the 4,000 separate castes should fuse themselves into four Varnas, that is Chaturvarnia. Whereas Ambedkar considered the four Varnas as the parent of caste system, and he stood for the annihilation of Varnas and caste system. Ambedkar's analysis of Indian caste system and his efforts to abolish untouchability and eradicate caste system are as relevant today as it was some 84 years ago. So that's what I have about annihilation of caste. I believe the points are very clear. Thank you.